So, good morning again. We are now going to a completely different topic, which is uh, vascular malformations. And uh, this is the layout of the lecture. So we will deal a, bit, a little bit about the classification so everybody understands what actually is a vascular malformation. The differential that go into the vascular malformations of head and neck <coughs> and also intracranial. So uh, generally when, when we speak about uh, vascular lesions in, in general, we, we gather tumors and malformations and we are going to, uh, to see why is that. But actually these are completely different uh, uh, lesions uh, that uh, need to be uh, separated. Uh, it's interesting that uh, one third of the children have a birthmark and this birthmark is a vascular anomaly. Uh, but the, the number that actually require uh, medical evaluation is uh, very low. It's 1%. And just one in, uh, in 1,000, um, it will have a complex vascular malformation. So there have been, from uh, over the years, many classifications. And uh, the one that, that I'm going to, to speak about it is the one from um, 2014 for the International Society of Vascular uh, anomalies uh, that has actually been um, uh, 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 renewed, uh, updated in 2018. And basically what we need to, to separate in our minds when we are dealing with this is to differentiate tumors uh, from malformation. Tumors have an increased mitotic activity, so there is cellular proliferation. Vascular malformations do not have cellular pro proliferation, although may, they may change in size. They change in size because they have a growth that is proportional to the growth of the child, and also in the adult because there may be dilatation of the arteries and the veins, but there is no mitotic activity. The growth of the malformation, uh, especially in the, in the pediatric population, is proportional to the growth of the rest of the body and the head of the child. Tumors, they have a completely disproportional uh, growth. And so uh, this is the main differentiation that we have. So when we have these two, uh, two streams, vascular tumors and vascular malformation, we have vascular tumors with cellular proliferation, mitotic activity, and vascular malformation with abnormal morphogenesis. So hemangiomas are actually vascular tumors. They have cellular proliferation. There are, the most common one is the infantile one. There are other ones that we are not going to deal here in this lecture. The vascular malformation, they can affect any type of, vex, uh, of, of channel. They may be venous, capillary, arterial venous, they also may affect the lymphatic system, and you may have cause, uh, uh, cases that you have mixed. You have venolymphatic, venocapillary, or even with more than two components. So uh, this would be uh, the classification that if you go to the website uh, of the, the society <coughs> we are going to see. So separation clearly into vascular tumors and vascular malformation. The simple ones which are affecting one of the components, the combined one, and then you are going to see that we are going to have um, uh, more complex uh, types. Generally, we define uh, the, also in the literature the slow flow malformations from the high flow malformation. The slow flow malformation will include the ones that have lymphatic, capillary, and venous components, and the high flow whenever you have abnormal arterial venous communication, either malformation or a fistula. On the other hand, you, are, you have vascular anatomic variants, which uh, are also important in the intracranial compartment, as we are going to see, but these are not malformations. So what about tumors? So the most common one the, the, uh, uh, is the infantile uh, uh, hemangioma, and it's clinically typical, it has three phases a proliferative phase, which is increasing in size until the age of nine months, then a plateau, which will become stable, and in an involutive phase. It will spontaneously regress in size until the age of 10. We can also add medication like beta blockers to uh, induce this or uh, uh, stimulate this involutive phase. Uh, but, uh, 
almost 20% of the cases will leave some scar, as you see here, a fat tissue scar associated with the lesion. How do we see it? Well, we see it as a tumor. It's a mass. So it has soft tissue component and has vessels inside, dilated arteries and also dilated veins. And if you do an angiogram, you are going to see this is the external carotid artery. This should be the normal size of the external carotid artery. And you see the, 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 the feeders that, that uh, supply the tumor, they are highly dilated. The blush, which is this stain that you have here, corresponds to the, the solid component of the tumor that is also the enhancing part. Okay? So... Uh, it's going to have mass effect, it's going to have a solid component that will enhance. It's like a tumor. But you are going to see inside dilated vessels, arteries and veins. What about malformation? So malformation, we have seen that they can affect uh, uh, lymphatic veins, capillary, and they can be arteriovenous. The lymphatic malformation 75% of them are at the head and neck area. And if you actually take the time when you are doing these type of studies and do some target questions to the patients, you are going to make the diagnosis before they enter the CT or MR machine. So the, the lymphatic malformation are soft tissue mass, as you see here. They transilluminate. So if you, uh, you put a light, you are going to see that they transilluminate. And this is the tip. They swell with infections because they have lymphatic tissue. And the parents will tell you this right away because they notice. <coughs> there is no bruit, no pulsation, because there is no arteriovenous shunting. It's not warm, and you have generally intact skin over the lymphatic uh, uh, malformation. The complications are due to obstruction of the respiratory tract at the head and neck, mass effect, and infection or lymphatic obstruction. These are the most common ones. So you are going to see them as a, a, a multiple channel uh, structure with uh, uh, large cysts or with small cysts. What is important uh, <coughs> if you do ultrasound is that there is no vascularity, no, uh, and you are going to have fluid, fluid levels. And this is also very typical. On the CT, you are going to look for fluid, fluid levels. You are going to see that these lesions are transpatial. In opposition to the other head and neck lesions, they don't respect the neck boundaries. And they may be like this, large cystic lesion with septi that enhance. The only thing that will enhance in the lymphatic malformation are the septi in between the cysts. That can be large or small. The angiography, it's going to be negative. To, to fill this, you need to do a direct puncture. Okay? Again, on the MR, you want to see the fluid, fluid levels, and this is very typical for the lymphatic malformation. You also see the septi that can also enhance with contrast, as you see here, and the transpatial uh, 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 topography at the head and neck. What about the venous malformation? Again, a large amount of them will be at the head and neck. They look like these bluish uh, 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 lesions and that you can actually compress. They are very soft. They are no thrill or bruit. There is no AV shunt. You may feel some hardening parts inside, which are flabolites that you see here in this large uh, venous malformation. And typically, what you are going to ask the patient, is this malformation going to increase in size when you do the Valsalva maneuver on you put your hand, uh, your head down? And this is because you decrease the venous reflux and the lesion will increase in size. Complication is bleeding, but bleeding is minor because it's a venous bleeding. You just compress and it's <laughs> over. And thrombosis. The thrombosis will produce episodic pain. And with the episodic pain comes a flavolite, generally. So on the CT, what you are going to look is for the flavolites. 
So you see a lesion that is transpatial, uh, that is uh, high on, on, on uh, dense on the CT, slightly hyperdense on T2, and you look for the flavolites, and this will make you the diagnosis. The contrast enhancement may be present. It is diffuse because it's going to fill the venous lakes of the malformation, and it's a very delayed contrast enhancement. DSA is, again, negative to, because it's on the venous size. If you want to see it, you need to puncture, and you inject, and you see the compartment of the venous malformation. And you see how the contrast stays there and does not go to a vein. Eventually, at a later phase, uh, it will be drained. Well, capillary malformations, we generally don't image them uh, because it's no needed. The diagnosis is just looking at it. You have two cases here. Uh, in this case, you have an hemifacial a capillary malformation associated with a syndrome that we are going to see further on. And here you have telangiectasias in a patient with Randu osler weber syndrome. So this, you look to the patient and you make the diagnosis. You don't need to do imaging unless you suspect that there may be other type of lesions inside. If they are very subtle uh, signs, you see they are uh, slightly hyperintense on the T2, and they may have contrast enhancement on the late phase. And again, for pure capillary malformation, the DSA is generally uh, negative. Well, now we come to the arteriovenous malformation. That can be like a malformation with an idus, a plexiform junction of arteries and veins, or just a direct communication between an artery and a vein, and in that case, we call it a fistula. So it's different. It's a warm pulsatile mass because it's, it's an AV fistula. It's an arterial communication. You feel a, a, a thrill when you palpate the lesion, and you hear a brewery, and this is because of the high flow of the lesion. It may actually increase in size, and this is seen on during puberty and pregnancy and after trauma, So, uh, because it's going to trigger the angiogenic event and become a, a very uh, a, a larger malformation. So partial treatment, either surgical or endovascular, it's not recommended because it's going to do more harm. You may see around the malformation that is only vessels. There is no soft tissue. This is how you differentiate it from a, a tumor. There is no soft tissue mass associated. There is no enhancement, so there will be no capillary blush just communication between arteries and veins. Um, but you may have fatty uh, hypertrophy and muscle atrophy as a secondary changes locally due to the presence of the, uh, the malformation. It may have pain. The hemorrhage is important. The hemorrhage is important because it is an arterial hemorrhage. This is especially important uh, in the nose in the jaws where you may have a tooth extraction and have a massive bleeding and in children may lead to a high output heart failure. So it's look like this. So you have arteries that are dilated and you have veins that will fill very early and will drain the malformation. But actually there is no soft tissue mass associated. You may have calcification on the areas of uh, the junction of the arteries and the veins, that we call it the nidus. And um, on the MR, you are going just to see the flow voids. You see here the angio, the 3D angio, where actually you are superimposing to the bone the, uh, the, uh, the all extensive malformation and to do the, the, the treatment and then to the surgery. So on DSA, there is no capillary blush as we've seen in hemangiomas, just direct AV communication. So let's uh, wrap it up. This in important points for the lymphatic, swelling with infection, transpatial, cysts, and fluid fluid levels. Venus, swelling with the valsalva maneuver, episodes of pain due to focal thrombo uh, thrombosis, and what we are looking into is to the flavolites. The capillary, there is no specific uh, uh, clinical presentation, just look at the patient, you make the diagnosis.
arteria venous, that you feel a, 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 a thrill, you hear a bruit, it's pulsatile lesions, you may have active arterial bleedings. And you, on the imaging, you see enlarged vessels, no intermingled soft tissue, and no mass effect. The tumors, which the most common one is the infantile uh, hemangioma, has the typical three phases, proliferative, plateau, and, evolution, uh, and evolutive. It's not compressive because it's a tumor, it's a solid mass. And uh, you see the soft tissue and the vessels dilated inside, but there is a soft tissue mass. <coughs> what about intercranial? Well, we have also the same vascular malformations, and <coughs> meaning you are going to have the venous ones, which is the cavernomas, the capillary ones, which is the capillary telangiectasias, the arteriovenous, arteriovenous communication. This can be at the ventricles, and we call it choroidal AVMs. If it's uh, during the uh, a fetal period, it's going to give a malformation that is the one that is more commonly found in uh, fetal MR, which is the vein of gallon there is malformation, just for you to know. Then we have pile AVMs. Pile AVMs are fed by leptomeningeal arteries. Dural AVMs are fed by dural arteries. So mainly this comes from anterior cerebral artery, middle cerebral artery, posterior cerebral artery on the supertentorial compartment, the cerebellar arteries on the infratentorial compartment, and the dural AVF will come from the dural vessels that mostly come from the external carotid artery. What about cavernomas? Well, they, they may be sporadic, they may be familiar, and when you have familiar cavernomas, the possibility to have multiple lesions is higher. The clinical presentation, hemorrhage, seizures, and then neurological deficits. The hemorrhage rate is uh, uh, rated into 2 to 4% patient year, and the ones that bleed more are the ones that have previous had a bleeding, and they have deep location and are located at the brainstem. Also, the, most one, the ones that are more difficult to take out. So how do they look? On CT, it may be completely normal, you may miss it, or you may see a slightly hyperdense lesion, as you see here, and actually you are going to need to, do, to look at the MR to make the complete diagnosis. The signal intensity on the MR is very, very different. You may have, like this one, uh, hyperintense on T1 and uh, hyperintense on T2 with low two signals that is the typical popcorn appearance, but you may have the ones that are just completely hypo uh, intense on all sequences uh, like this one. So there is no pitfall for the cavernomas. Uh, if you see one that looks like a cavernoma, the other ones should look like it also. If there is a DVA associated, it helps you to make the diagnosis. But abo above all, there are lesions there that even with large um, uh, size, they may have no edema associated because they have been there for a long time. The angio, catheter angio, is negative because it's an occult malformation. If you suspect of a cavernoma, you need to do T2 star or susceptibility imaging to look at that image and to uh, that lesion and to the presence of other lesions. So the typical form of the, the cavernoma, uh, uh, ISO hyper on T1 and the, the, the same on T2, and you see, you look at the T2 star, you see multiple cavernomas on this patient. Again, multiple cavernomas, also think about the familiar cases. Another one, you see one, this has edema around it, so actually uh, it has change in size. This, the, they change in size because they bleed into inside the lesion and have edema. You see it here uh, on the MR and also on the infratentorial compartment this patient had two more cavernomas and associated with the DVAs which helps you. DVAs are development venous anomalies that we are going to speak further on but help you to make the diagnosis. Capillary telangiectasias you are not going to see them on CT. On MR, they are very difficult to see on T1 and T2. Maybe a slight hyperintensity, but it's difficult. Where you see it, like here, 
It's on T2 star and SWI, which this low signal intensity. If you give contrast on very late acquisition, you may be having a fade contrast enhancement. Again, they are bigger than micro bleeds. They don't have hemorrhagic, uh, 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 they don't have mass effect or edema, and they may enhance. Now we come to the arteriovenous components, and the arteriovenous components can be at the pile vessels, so these are located at the sub pile area, these are the brain AVMs, and, and then we are going to speak about the dural ones. The pile AVMs, they have look like this dilated arteries, a converging area of abnormal vessels that we call the nidus, and the enlarged draining vein. <coughs> this is what you see on a brain AVM. These AV shunts are non-nutritive to the brain. So these vessels at the nidus areas, they don't supply the brain, so they may be taken out without problem. Well, they are a result from congenital errors of the vessels, and they may occur in any age. If you want to report this, you use the surgical classification that is the most commonly one used, which is a Spetzler-Martin grade, and it's very easy. You look at the size of the AVM, the location, if it's eloquent or non-eloquent, so motor area is eloquent, uh, the uh, visual area is eloquent, the, the brainstem is eloquent, so forth, and if there is a superficial venous drainage or a deep venous drainage. This classification is helpful to understand the, the, the severity of the malformation, especially in regards to the prognosis for surgery. Regarding the natural history, the problem, the major problem is hemorrhage, and it's quoted around 2 uh, to 4 percent a year, and it's higher in the AVMs that are infratentorial, deep located and with deep venous drainage, and of course, the ones that have previously bled. How do we see it? We see it on the, uh, the, 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 the CT, the MR, the DSA, the MRA. Here you see an MRA, 3D time of flight. You see the nidus, you see the enlarged artery, which is the PCA, and you see the, the draining vein. It's important when you look to the parenchyma to look if there is, has been previous hemorrhage associated. Look at, first at the angioarchitecture of the brain AVM. So, feeding arteries, which are the arteries that are dilated? Here we have no doubts it's going to be the anterior cerebral artery. Where is the nidus? Where is the nidus located? At the size of the nidus, if it's uh, subarachnoid, cortical, cortical, subcortical, or cortical ventricular goes to the, from the cortical surface to the ventricular. And you can use the MR to look and the MRA to look at your features uh, and to look where is the arteries and where are the veins of the malformation. Sometimes it's difficult. You see there is here a very small brain AVM that has bled, has a, a scar here. So don't look only for the 3D uh, mean ip, uh, MIP images, but look into the source images because you are going to more probably to see the nidus. You can use 4-3 uh, MRA where you do a dynamic uh, uh, acquisition of, uh, of the vessels like a DSA. Look at the parenchyma if there is gliosis of previous hemorrhage because the ones that have previous hemorrhage have, as I told you, a higher risk for re-bleeding. Dural AVFs are the other type of arteriovenous shunts that we can have. And these are located at the dura mater. They are not in the brain, they are in the coverings of the brain. So they are going to be fed by, um, by uh, dural arteries mostly coming from the external carotid artery. What is the key point here is to answer this. Is there cortical veins associated with the dural AVF? Because if you see pile arteries dilated, this means that the dural AVF is rerouting the blood into those pile veins, and this means that the patient has a higher risk for hemorrhage. If they don't have it, the risk of hemorrhage is zero. If they have cortical venous uh, 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 reflex, the risk of hemorrhage can be up to 35% a year. 
How do you see it? You see abnormal vessels, as you see, many vessels, but you don't see anidus. This is the difference. You see on the SWI so many vessels dilated, but where is the nidus? You cannot find it. So this is, would be a sign for, uh, for uh, a dural AVF. Then you look at your MRA and uh, you see that the shunting area, these multiple vessels, are going to be in the dura mater and uh, near the dural sinus. Look into the source images, you see the dural sinus, the torcular and the two transverse sinus and almost these transosseous and dural vessels going there and having the shunt. So you need to actually to look here to the image. And you see that this sinus here is arterialized with a flow that is similar to an artery. Can also do the dynamic imaging, and you see here where actually it's filling the torcular area with a reflux into the deep venous system. On the arterial phase, we start to see the veins. Again, the DSA is the gold standard to uh, evaluate the risk. But there are more complex cases. There are, classic, there are malformations that are association of different types of malformations. So, and I, I recommend you to go to the website. We don't have many uh, time to look at it, but you see here this is uh, the patient that I've shown that has a clipal trenone syndrome and they had the capillary malformation, but also uh, an aneurysm and also a, a, a spinal cord uh, a malformation. So as a conclusion, uh, I would say that uh, use the appropriate terminology because we need to communicate uh, with each other. So uh, look at this classification. Take into the clinical history and the physical exam of the patient because you are going to make the diagnosis before the patient enters the, the, your machine to do the CT or the MR. And to the intracranial malformation, assess the hemorrhagic risk that we have seen for the dural AVFs, the cortical venous reflux, and for the brain AVMs, the, uh, uh, the previous hemorrhage. Thank you very much. Is there any question? If not, we are going to repeat this on the workshop and we are going to review some of the cases of the uh, workshop. Okay. So we start with this uh, male, 13 years old, and his main complaint was epistaxis. And what do we see? Well, so you have the first set of images, T1, and with contrast, and the set of image which is the T2. So the patient has epistaxis, we should look to the nasal fossa to see if there is something there. What is happening here? Go ahead. Uh, Non-contrast enhanced, we see uh, a small hyperintensity left behind the, the orbital conus. Um, after contrast, we see a big uh, uh, enhancing soft tissue mass at the, uh, at the uh, base, uh, brain basis and with contact to the, the ethmoid uh, cells and uh, the sphenoid sinuses. Um, and in T2, uh, we see uh, a high intensity um, at, the, at the same level. So I would go for a, for a tumor and the most common one is, is uh, uh, hemangioma. Okay. Uh, the age of the patient, the epistaxis, uh, should bring you um, other possibilities. So we did an angiogram. And this is the external carotid artery. This is the internal maxillary artery. This, and this is artery, and this is an early vein draining here. So this is the facial vein. What is happening here? Is this a vessel malformation? 
to pick blush. Very good. So it's not a vascular malformation, it's a tumor, right? But he has high uh, vascularization, so it's a high vascular tumor. And with the typical location uh, at the nasopharynx and the, the, the presentation at this age uh, and, and the findings is a juvenile angiofibroma. And this is uh, a, a differential diagnosis that we stu should start when we actually think about vascular malformation. The first point is, is this a vascular malformation or a tumor? I see flow voids inside. I see many vessels. Uh, how can I deal with that? So, because, and the, the question is because you have, so the answer is you have soft tissue mass, and this will make the difference. You have soft tissue mass in between the abnormal vessels, which does not happen in vascular malformation. The most common vascular tumors are the juvenile angiofibromas, in this case, the hemangiomas, the paragangliomas, and of course, the metastasis. Okay. So now I have shown you this picture, and this is a volume rendering of the face of the patient. So it has a large area here, and you see the MIP images, and now you see the axial um, from the CT uh, post contrast. And what do you think, what do you see, and what do you think this is? Who has the microphone? It looks like it's got a large mass with flebolithes. Um, well, not mass, but um, a venous malformation with all the flebolithes. Okay. So can you, uh, uh, now you are going to, to speak with me, and I need to probably put some needles there and to inject some sclerotic agents, and I need to know where this lesion is located, which are the spaces of the, the head and neck where it's located. It's just one space? Or it's no, it's more transspatial. It looks like it's mistake, uh, mas masticator space in the... Um, okay. Uh, oh, God. Sort of parapharyngeal space as well. Okay. And pterygoid space. It's all parapharyngeal pterygoid space, so it's transspatial. And here? It looks like in the sublingual space. And the... Oh, I can't remember what space it's called, but the superficial... Okay, Mandible. so very good. So we have seen that it's transpatial. So what we are seeing here on the, on, on, on the, uh, the face of the patient was just a superficial component. And this is why actually we ask for imaging in these patients. It's not to confirm the diagnosis, because generally we know the diagnosis. It's to evaluate the extension, because it's going to be very difficult to approach this deeper component of the lesion. So what we want to know is the extension. And there are some, some areas that are particularly complicated because of the complications, and those are the orbit we like to know if the orbit is involved or not. Okay, so this is how it looks, I have shown you. So you just inject, uh, you puncture, you inject, and these lesions have many compartments. So they are not sometimes communicating, they are multiple compartments, and you, you just feel one part of the lesion, then if you puncture here, you add another part of the lesion, as you would see, here, different compartments, different venous lakes of the lesion, okay? So imaging on these cases, obviously, is to make the diagnosis, but more important than to make the diagnosis is to evaluate the extension of the lesion. Okay, so this patient uh, we have already seen, so he's coming to the angel room. Uh, but before coming to the engine room, you had a talk with him. So what were his complaints? Now, you are going to be the patient. So he would tell you, doctor, I have this since I was born? Yes or no? Yeah, maybe, yeah. Yeah, so he would... Uh, do you feel any pain, generally, what the patient would say? No. And uh, 
Do you feel anything when you touch the lesion? Soft, Soft compressive. And what is thrill? It's pulsating, okay? And you feel it. It's just like you're touching an artery, okay? And if you had a cut here or a, a trauma, it would be like <coughs> a huge bleeding, okay? So again, the images, you are, we are planning to do the pre-treatment and then followed by the surgery. And, and you see the extension, not into the orbit, uh, because uh, it may uh, ha be more complicated and you see how we actually deal with the approach of the patient to see the location. So you see that goes in temporal area into the facial area. And after embolization, and this is what you see, so on black you see all the vessels that were embolized, we embolized many, 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 and you see here how is the the dilated veins that it was taken out as a block. And you, to treat this, you actually need to take it everything out. Now, particle, I mean, you can embolize it with particles, but we prefer a permanent embolic agents. So we do it with uh, cyanoacrylate, which is glue, or we do it with onyx. So it's a very high flow fistula. We don't use onyx, we do glue. If it's not, we are going to do with onyx, okay? So again, just remember, vascular tumors are different from vascular malformation. The main issue has to do with the growth and the presence of soft tissue uh, mass. So this we have seen, again, vascular tumors, cellular proliferation, vascular malformation, abnormal morphogenesis, and again, remember, when you are talking about vascular malformation, give them a name. It's lymphatic. Uh, is venous, is capillaries, or is arteriovenous, or is mixed. Okay? This is the classification. It's not very helpful to, f to say it. it's flow flow or high flow. Just name it as the component more important. So a, a pictorial uh, view of the different lesions. So arteriovenous lesions, you are going to have uh, dilated arteries and veins. Venous, you are going to look at the flavolites. The lymphatic, you are going to see the orbit, the fluid, fluid levels. And you see the, the macrocystic areas here. <clears throat> the hemangiomas, you see here and you see there, they are soft tissue mass, highly vascularized, so they will enhance. Okay, so just an overview, you don't need to know this, but how you treat nowadays uh, infantile hemangiomas, uh, you give mostly beta blockers, propranolol is the treatment of choice, but they will involute spontaneously. Lymphatic, there is no medical treatment for lymphatic venous and arterial venous. What you are going to do uh, is sclerotherapy with specific agents for lymphatic and venous. Uh, you can also do surgery, but most of the times you do sclerotherapy. And for arterial venous, you do embolization in surgery. For capillary, what you use more is laser therapy for the capillary malformations of the skin. Okay. So, what we have here? Okay, uh, we have a bleeding in the right parietal lobe. Yes, with the surrounding edema. Okay, so this is a young patient. We are concerned uh, of what possibilities? It could be uh, an AVM. AVM. A vascular be. malformation, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Or a cavernoma. Yeah. So what you, a cavernoma, what you want to see, an MR? CT angio or well, MR? I give you the MR. I don't. We didn't. We skip the, the 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 CTA and put the patient on the MR. So acute hemorrhage. Huh? Yes, acute hemorrhage. And the MR shows. Same with um, what is what is strange about the, the T1 images? 
Well, the hematoma we have there, there, it's this part here, okay? There's some uh, hemocytorin, I guess. Yeah. Some old hemorrhage? What, not, what, what is happening here? You think these yeah, are there are some strange vessels, so... Strange vessels. So, and, and they seem like, like converging to another vessel, no? It's Very close to the ventricle. Yes, so it's... Uh, and it's hyper intense on, on, on T1. So it's, these vessels have no flow, right? So it's, uh, it could because be a DVA? Because if it's good the T1 is to see the flow void, if you have a flow void on T1, the vessels are open. If you have a high signal on T1 inside the vessel, what are you suspecting? Thrombosed. So you have... Thrombosed? Very good. Could be a thrombosed draining vein of a brain AVM. Okay? This was the T2, very old case, with hemorrhage and then a huge edema. The and, well, the, the follow up, the patient recovered. And this was the angio at that time, and this was the angio, the follow-up angio. What is the difference between one and the other? What is happening here? It's a vein. Do we see early filling of the vein? No. So this vein is a large vein, it's a thrombose. It's a thrombose cortical vein. But this vein actually with this area here, like a couple of <coughs> medusae, it's a special variant which is a development venous anomaly. So what are development venous anomalies? They are not malformation. They, are, they, they have this configuration the caput medusae converging to a vein that can be draining superficially or deeply. You see here a very large development venous anomaly. So it's draining normal brain tissue. It cannot be taken out. And as any other vein, it may thrombose. So you see how they look. They look like this on the angio, on the MR, on the CT is the same. They have this caput medusae shape. They converge into one or two collectors and then they drain into a dural sinus or the deep venous system. Okay? More extreme variations and a smaller variation there. They can be superficial, draining to the superficial venous system, or deep draining into the deep venous system. What they help is on the diagnosis of cavernomas because there is a high association between DVAs and cavernomas. You see here a, a bleeding cavernoma uh, that has edema, has increased in size, and you see the DVA very close to the cavernoma in the patient that had other two uh, additional cavernomas. Another, another variant is the sinus pericrani, where you have veins, normal veins, that go outside the brain through holes in, the, in the, the skull and communicate the intracranial drainage, you see here, with the extracranial superficial drainage, another one here. Okay? Very good. You um, see um, hypertension lesion the left uh, table with uncle. Looks like a hemorrhagic lesion, right? Might be, yeah. Okay. And now with the, um, the MR, you can make your diagnosis. In the MRI, you see that this lesion is... Uh, 
mainly hyperindent on the T2 sequence and mainly hyperindent on the T1. This is a, a, a dark fluid or flare image with, flare with flare. fat set. So, okay, so you have a lesion, you have seen, uh, it's in the pons and the middle um, cerebellar peduncle, is well delimitated, has edema, meaning that has changed in size recently, looks like have blood components inside, okay, different stages. If it was a normal hematoma, just from a bleeding of a vessel, it would not be heterogeneous. It would have a layer appearance. This is heterogeneous. So what are we going to put on the differential diagnosis? But do you see the vessels, abnormal ves vessels? So it's not going to be an arterial venous malformation. A cavernoma. Okay, could also be a hemorrhagic metastasis. There is anything on the three images that will actually help us? Very good, you see. Then, to be helpful, you look for the DVA. If there is a DVA associated, it must probably be a cavernoma. Okay? So you do your T2 star, you have the blooming effect, you see the T1 now with the, the, the bleeding, uh, the new bleeding there, and uh, you had the DVA. You see it here on the SWI crossing uh, the lesion. Okay? So look for the DVA uh, because it will help you. If he had not the DVA, you, it could be also the cavernoma, but the presence will allow you to be more confident on your diagnosis. Is, is it quite common that they are so, is it quite common that they are so close together? Because I think I've seen that before as well. Yeah, the typical thing is uh, when we say associated, it's not a cavernomen at the cerebellum and a DVA at the frontal lobe. It's a neighborhood lesion. So it's, it's, it's not a lesion, it's a, uh, um, uh, a variant, uh, the DVA. So uh, it's very close to the cavernoma. So they, they are in the same area. Okay? I think that's something that people might get wrong. If, if you just hear associated, you think, oh, yeah, that also exists yeah. in the same no, patient. No, 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 it's in the... That's it's interesting. Associated, but at the same time, at, at the same uh, place, spot. What about this one? Who wants to take it? It's very <laughs> straightforward. We have already. Uh, going toward ventral aspect of the uh, brain stem. Mm, yeah, it might be a cover normal, but also I think the, 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 the vessel that we are just confronting might be a, an artery or something like that, huh? Okay, let's, let's, let's analyze this. So um, I look to the T2 star and SWI and I see blood, mm -hmm. right? There is blood there. And but I don't see the blood on the T2 nor on the T1, right? Mm -hmm. So it was not a previous bleeding, like a scar from a hypertensive pontine hematoma. Mm -hmm. what, do I, what are the things that I can see on SWI T2 star that I don't see generally on the T2 or the T1? Capillary telangiectasis. Good. A faint Capillary telangiectasis. Okay, so, and, and they all fit. You see, you only see it here. It's like a multiple spot of vessels, maybe with normal brain tissue around it. And if you give contrast on very late acquisition, you have some contrast enhancement. And then obviously, you have a vein that is crossing this area and is going to drain, in this case, to the petrous vein. That could be an associated DA. DVA. Because these lesions are not, they, the vascular lesions, very frequently, if we look closely, there are more than one type of lesions, okay? So we know. 
So we have seen now the venous, the capillary telangiectasias. And now let's move to another case. So this patient has 60-something years. It's, it's a male. Who has the microphone? You have, you can pass it. It's the second row on the... <coughs> they don't want it, pass it this way. So we have a... I think these are two one images, so it's a T1 hyperintense lesion in the temporal lobe. Yeah. Superior temporal gyrus. Okay, I'm going to show you. Oh, so we move on. So we had a hematoma, brain hematoma, acute. And we moved to uh, the other images, just confirm it. And we moved it to the um, angiography. Uh, uh, angio, sorry, angio um, on the MR. So, and I'm going to give you the uh, 2D time of flight where we are looking into the veins and tell you that the hematoma was on this side, so it was on the left side. So what is happening here? There is no flow signal in the uh, transverse and sigmoid uh, sinus. Very good. So what we are seeing here is so we have the superior sagittal sinus, the torque would be here, the transverse sinus on one side, and we don't have the transverse sinus on the other side. These are veins uh, um, uh, of the vertebral plexus. And when we look to this image here, and we are seeing what you think are Collateral venous. Because it does not suppress on the time of flight. Okay, so these are venous collaterals. Very good. Can I m give you another picture? This picture. This is the hematoma. Now I have a 3D time of flight. I'm looking into the arteries, and I'm looking into the veins here, in the 2D time of flight. What is happening? Do you see the sinus here? Sinus should be here, going, doing like this. What is so the very small vessel on Here? this area, a high flow vessel? Very good. And arteries or veins? These are um, artery, maybe from a AVM. We, we are going to go there. And but step I cannot, by step. And this is the, on the right side. It's a venous time of flight. This is a venous, right? But if the flow is too high in the venous vessel, I have a flow void. No, on the time of flight we would get it. This, believe me, is very high flow here. So you are right in the first part. So these are dilated arteries. What I'm going to ask you here, these here, are these arteries are pile meaning branches from the ACA, MCA, PCA, anterior, posterior, or middle cerebral artery, or are dural arteries? Pile? Okay, let's, let's try to, to refute that, uh, that proposition. If it was pile and it's a high flow IV something, uh, these arteries should have been dilated. I would right. I, I would say it's 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 uh, it's dural because uh, 
from the from the location, uh, I would suggest that the, that the left PCA would be much more dilated, and which obviously isn't. Okay. So you, would, you do, wouldn't have a brain AVM on this side without dilatation of the pile arteries. So it cannot be pile arteries with this size. No way. So if it's not pile, it's dural. No brainer there. Okay? Let's look at the, the source images. It's essential. Where are these abnormal vessels located? Uh, on the on the dural abdominal phase. At that dural sinus, right? So it was dural vessels and the dural sinus. Now we know that this patient has AV fistula. Perfect. Dural AV fistula. Perfect. Now just missing one piece of the puzzle. But where is the sinus? Uh, it's an, a fistula after a thrombosis of the sinus. Yes, so it's a fistula associated with a thrombosis of the sinus. Last piece. Where is this dural AVF draining to? You, to the you answer. To the, to the petrous sinus? You answer. Where is draining the fistula? You answer. You were the first one. To say that these were out to the collateral, to the collateral. Collateral. But yeah. which collaterals are these ones? This, do you think these are dural veins? It's a what? Draxial blood flow is this? Pile, cortical veins. So this is a severe. Uh, aggressive dural AVF <coughs> or a benign type? Aggressive. Aggressive, because it's using the veins of the brain. Okay? So let's look at what is happening on the angio. So you see, the dural vessels, nothing coming from the pile. The, sh the, the sinus is thrombosed, distally and proximally, and is using all these veins to drain the fistula. That's why it bled. It bled from where? From here, from the artery, from where? The patient had a, a lower hematoma, right? Here. The dural was here. Let's go back. The dural AVF was here, as we have seen, and the hematoma is here. What bled in this patient? The pile veins. The so pile veins, okay? If you, you look... This is the angio. You see all these veins are trying to drain the fistula because the, the sinus is thrombosed. And when you do the fusion of the images of the dural AVF that is located here and the hematoma that is located here, you clearly understand that the rupture was a vein, was from the, the, the cortical venous reflux. Okay? And this is why the dural AVFs bleed. I think we have time for one more case. You see here... This is the area of the dural AVF. You see pa uh, dural vessels going. This is a dural coming from the, the ICA, and you have the middle meningeal artery going and feeding also the dural uh, AVF. And this is the treatment. We are going to skip this. So two classifications. The Borden classification is very simple. Type 2 and type 3 have cortical venous reflux, are using the cortical veins to a shunt at the dural sinus or directly into the cortical veins. And these are the ones that have hemorrhagic risk. And the one, one is the Cognar classification, uh, also this, a little bit more complex, but also with the same uh, concept of the, uh, how the, the, the dural AVF is draining. Okay? There are other rare types of dural AVFs. In the, inf in the infantile type, you have multiple shunts associated with thrombosis. And you have, this is even rarer, we have malformations of the sinus. This you can see in neutral, and you see all the, the arteries shunting into this. And this is a dural sinus malformation with AV shunts. Okay? So, going to this part of the, uh, of the classification. So, the most common one is the adult type that was the case that we have seen. Okay.
Very easy. With this clinical presentation, with this MR, the diagnosis is spinal EVF. Why is that? We have a white cord and we have many vessels around the spinal cord. Okay, so this is a dural AVF of the spinal cord. The question is, the diagnosis is made, but the question is, where is the fistula point? Because it can be in any artery coming from here until the sacrum. Well, we do a dynamic MRA. You see anything abnormal? I'll show you how many times you want to see. Where? Where is it? You see the, 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 uh, the intercostal, the lumbar arteries, the sacral one. Do you see the, the veins dilated? Do you see the fistula point? But on, uh, around the right kidney, there is uh, more contrast in the retroperitoneal zone. I have another image here, which is the pitfall. What I have been telling you since the beginning of this lecture regarding it is, this is a, a MIP, and you cannot uh, make the difference in the deep. Good. So, so, we are going to do the same approach. We are going to look to the source images. So, we are going to do thinner slices, but dynamic also. Now, you see it? Okay. The vein there. And if you look to the source images, you see the vein. And if you are careful enough, you are going to look, look, and see that this does not come from an intercostal, nor a lumbar, but comes from a sacral artery. You don't believe it? We are going from the, the, the right uh, uh, femoral, left femoral, sacral artery, shunting there, and the vein is there. And the hard part is done, which was five minutes. This procedure took like... 20 minutes to cure the patient. If I had to do the angiogram from top to bottom, it would be a nightmare. For me for, and, and also for the patient, the dose of contrast and radiation. So we can look at it and we can make the diagnosis if we look careful to the images and the pitfall is look at the source images. Okay, so this we are distally. You see the distal part of the artery, so the catheter, microcatheter, and the, the shunting area, and then the vein that is draining. Okay? Last case. Young guy. Temporal hematoma. Another dural AVF. Okay? In this case, we actually did the... the the MR following, you see, very acute phase hematoma. Any particular thing regarding these images? Yeah, okay, so this is hyperintensity, so we have. So uh, the upper right, the upper right. <coughs> Do you have the pointer? No. Maybe it's just the, the lower part of the edema. Anybody sees anything else? Where do you see the superior petrosal sinus? So you are pointing here. Well, I think that those are artifacts. On, on the top right image there... Can you point? Um, just a bit anterior, this Very area, good. there are, um, that's flow, flow voids. Good. So you see flow voids. It's here. It's also here. 
and also here. We don't know if they are veins or arteries, but we see flow voids near the hematoma. So we, now we are suspecting of what? AVM at the top of the diagnosis. Okay. They were thinking when they did this study if it could be what? It's not. At least of the brain uh, veins, the, the ones that are draining the brain. And now you have also the thick MIP image. And do you see, look at here. This is the hematoma. The time of flight shows you the hematoma. Do you see anything, any abnormality? Very good. But when you go to the source images, it's clear that you see a dilated pile artery. So this tells you that it's a pile brain EVM. Okay. But now you are much, so you are at the last case of the workshop, so you are brilliant. You are going to tell me if I need to take this patient to the angio to treat the patient. You have the, the source images. Yeah. Well, what do you think this is? You follow the artery. Nidus inside the hematoma. This is this here. If it was not a hematoma there, you would say that this looks like what? Flow void, no? Could this be the source of the hemorrhage? Uh, could be what associated with this artery? Aneurysm of the brain EVM. And if it's inside the hematoma, it's clearly a false aneurysm. Okay? The T1 images would show you the, the, the flow voids around the, the, the hematoma. You see here. You see the CTA also, you see the dilated PCA, the nidus here, the draining vein there, and what is this? There is a pseudoaneurysm in the feeding vessel, you don't believe it? Okay, this is the angio, the artery, the nidus, and the pseudoaneurysm. Okay, and this was the bleeding point. And this has a higher rate for uh, re-hemorrhage. And actually what we are doing here, if the movie goes, it will go, is occluding that vessel and that aneurysm to block this, this uh, to prevent re-hemorrhage from this patient. This is glue injection, you see. We are feeling see the size of the aneurysm, and then we are going to take out the catheter, and it blocked the, the, the aneurysm, and we were able to control um, the aneurysm. And then on the other phase, we deal, dealt with the rest of the brain EVM and was able to cure the brain EVM uh, in this case with onyx and, and glue, okay? And on the follow-up uh, 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 images, you don't have any more the dilated artery and the, 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 the brain AVM was cured. So this was the previous and this was the post-embolization case, okay? I think we have reached the, our time. Thank you very much for your attention.